Anybody hear that? I'm fairly alarmed here. And welcome back to the Knights of Christendom. I'm your host, Frank. I'm joined here with my partner, Neil, as usual. How you doing, buddy? Doing fine. Nice to be back. Ah, great to have you back, my friend. So, uh, well, this abortion thing is really getting ramped up, just like a lot of us expected. Neil, um, the left is in a state of outrage here. Um, I, I really think we're seeing some, some, let's put it this way, dark forces start to show their heads at this point in time. Um, you know, of course, we had the leak that has exposed all the Supreme Court justices, uh, these forces out there that are trying to stop the overturning of Roe v. Wade are uh, they're protesting in front of the the justice house in an attempt to intimidate them to change their votes. Now we're seeing attacks against the Catholic Church, uh, you know, v vandals hitting up Catholic churches, spray painting, doing damage in their own way. I mean, it's really funny for a country like ours where we focus so much on things like economics and tax cuts and limited government and big government, all that stuff, nothing really ratchets up the American population really than a good social issue, something like abortion. And I think it's going to be another three to four weeks of hell here, Neil. Yeah, I think we're going to see a rise in violence, uh, which is not surprising from the left. They've always been violent when they don't get their way. <clears throat> And on this particular issue, it's always going to be against the church specifically uh, because they know that the church stands against abortion, no exceptions. It always has and always will. Yeah. And uh, that's going to infuriate people who just have to have their uh, baby murdering going on. Um, and a lot of this, too, they're emotionally attached to the subject. You know, a, lot of, a lot of these people have had abortions. Yeah. And so they, it's become their emotional attachment, their religion. That it has to be justified, or they have to admit that they murdered their own child, and they can't face that. Yeah, I think you're right on there. I, I think that's one of the reasons why politicians have been so hesitant to actually use legislative processes to try and end this thing, at least at a macro level, right? Because, again, you know, if you're a, an elected representative and you depend on the votes, you don't want to offend a good portion of the population that has something at stake when it comes to abortion and may have a history in the past. I mean, to be honest with you, if the Supreme Court does, in fact, turn this thing around and, and ban it in the end, and I'm not convinced it's going to happen, but but I'm hoping for the best here. Uh, if they do turn around and uh, overturn Roe v. Wade, you're effectively telling, what, 60, 70, 80 million women, however many women have had abortion, that they've done something wrong. You have. And so you can't escape that. And I think the sheer nature of women in our society right now, especially liberal white women, there's a certain element of screechiness, I guess, if you want to say that, to where, um, I don't know, something scares me about them, um, Neil, because they seem to be at the forefront of every liberal cause. Um, oftentimes they're single women, uh, college educated women, and uh, it is liberalism to its most logical end. Of course, feminism being um, at the core root of it all. And these are by far some of the most progressive left-leaning citizens heading us toward the, really the march of Marxism and have been now since at least the 1960s, Neil. Yeah, you know, I think uh, they're going to try to avoid <clears throat> saying that they've done anything wrong. I mean, politicians are going to avoid phrasing it that way. That's why they're so uh, happy to say, well, it goes back to the states. And they're kind of obfuscating the issue of having to declare that this is evil. They're trying to say, well, I don't have to declare it. I don't have to say this is wrong. I'm going to let the people vote on it in their own little states, you know, instead of making a stand and pointing out what this is. Um, 
And yeah, it, a lot of this comes from this toxic femininity, you know, that, which is ironic because they can't even define what a woman is, but now all of a sudden it's women's rights, you know? So it, yeah. Yeah, it, it, you're going to see more of the screeching and the violence and the yelling and all this kind of stuff from people who are just not rational. Yeah. Yeah. You know, for my part, when I came into sort of the, my, my age of reason and my curiosity for politics began to, well, sort of, you know, take a foothold when I was a young man in my early 20s. I came to the Republican Party conservative movement, per se, precisely because of this abortion reason. It was the only reason why I got curious about politics in the beginning. It was, I guess, my 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 my, my introduction into uh, into politics. And, you know, as a Catholic, I've always held that. You know, the child, regardless of the scientific debates, because I'm I'm so sick and tired of scientific debates, because the fact is the process of the conjugal act between man and woman, at some point, it leads to a baby, regardless of, of what point you want to terminate it. And whether it's at conception, whether it's a few days after, whatever it may be, and I don't know all about it, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not aborting babies in this country after three and four days or a week. We're aborting kids, we've been aborting kids weeks and months into a pregnancy, which I've never understood how any rational human being, and I do emphasize rational human being can justify the termination of a pregnancy. It, 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 it's, it's just natural to me, Neil, and it's why whenever I look at the issue of abortion, especially when I see these young college-age screeching women defy logic, defy reason, defy science in the end, I can only come to the conclusion either it's extreme guilt, like you mentioned, or there's possibly some demonic influence there. Well, yeah, I think it's, it's also they love to use um, emotionally charged arguments to justify what they're doing. They always bring up the rape and the incest. Um, Situa a situation, situational ethics to try and tear yeah. it down. Yes. Yeah, and it's it's an appeal to emotion, you know, make you feel bad and relate to this thing. You know, I read a post not long ago talking about how this woman had an abortion because, well, her child was going to suffocate and die anyway. It was because they were losing ambiotic fluid or something and, and the baby was going to die, you know, so she went and had it aborted. You don't get to murder a child because you think it's going to die anyway. And if it's going yeah. to die anyway, then that's a natural death. But you do all you can to save the life. That's and, right. And if you can't save the life and it dies, well, then that dies. That's in God's hands. But you do not take and dismember and murder a child because you think it's going to die or that it's going to suffer. And you think suffering is meaningless. Suffering has value. We can offer that up to God. That's not a meaningless life. And, you, and it's not up to you to murder a child. But all of that goes thrown out the window. Because it's emotional. It's, oh, I feel so bad for this situation. It's a difficult situation to be in. You know, and it, it's just all emotion. And they don't even stop to think that the child deserves a chance to live. And right. you don't have a right to rip it apart and kill it. That's right. And a part of me wants to say, if you support that, you should be the one to go and rip that child apart then. You should <laughs> be the one to go and kill it. Instead of paying someone else to do it so you don't have to see it happen. Beautifully said. No, no, I think you're exactly right. I think it's it's cold. I think it's callous. I think there's there's something that has gone wrong. And I do believe ultimately it is the byproduct, not only of the sexual revolution, but really the devolution of the family, the destruction of the family to where I think sexual sin uh, goes so far, so deep, so rampant in our culture now that it has poisoned the minds of really everybody, not just women, but men and women. And now we're trying to find ways to justify, uh, again, alleviating ourselves of, of those sins, because that's what we really do in America, right, under the guise of freedom and liberty. It's always been a battle against our fallen nature, and we've never really dealt with that issue. And abortion kind of alleviates another aspect of this sexual sort of morality and culture that eventually has consequences sort of down the line. And I think a lot of young ladies of, of liberal minded origins and usually from weak or broken families tend to fall in this trap. That's why a lot of times I think it's college age women 
Um, it, it's women that come from more progressive homes, even though I know it's happened across the board, even with many Catholic families. I, I get that for the most part, but it's also a part of loss of faith to where, you know, once a woman goes down the path of denying natural law and really the, the natural function, which is the beauty of motherhood, to me, you have a, a situation where, listen, we always talk about how men are emasculated in this sort of feminist society, but I think there's a situation where young women have compromised their soul, have compromised motherhood all in the name of Again, this liberal society that promises the material wealth, the material success, lots of comforts and pleasures and good times, and that comes at a cost, and it's the cost of another human being, Neil. Yeah, and you know, and the priest friend reminded me that where there's a where sin abounds in a person's life, they have less grace, and grace is an enlightenment of the mind. So with less grace, you have a darkening of the mind. Your reason goes out the window and you become more animalistic. You come, you operate more on an emotional level and you don't use your reason and you're losing your faith. And I know someone in my own life that is, that's, that's happening to them now. You know, there's someone I know that was vehemently pro-life. And, but as they've turned more and more to a sinful life, now all of a sudden they're starting to make exceptions, even on abortion. Yeah. Well, maybe for the life of the mother, maybe for this case, you know, all of a sudden they're making small little in exceptions to the parts of their life. All of a sudden parts of uh, the faith, they're starting to say, well, maybe we don't need to believe that so much. They start to become cafeteria Catholics, you know, and it's like you notice that it happens when they turn away. They start to darken their mind. And before you know it, they're compromising things you'd never think they compromise on. Now, all of a sudden, they're eh, maybe not so much. Yeah, yeah, and I think part of that is the influence of the liberal culture as we've continued to liberalize um, more and more, um, and and the effects that I've had, you know, the media and the talking points, and that we constantly see. I think there's also a libertarian mindset that I think is destructive in America, you know, um, and, and I think also too you have a classical liberal movement. Um, while, while, while I will say that the left is absolutely satanically inspired, in my opinion, at this point in time, but there is a classical liberal element in the sense that they set up the parameters for this to work out to its most logical conclusion, and, mm -hmm. and that is abortion on demand at some point, even though classical liberals themselves may personally oppose it because we become a libertine, libertarian society. Um, I, I mean, listen, if you're going to allow sexual license to be pervasive in America, right? Without any moral foundations, the pornography, the disordered life, the divorce and remarriage, the contraception, there's gonna have to be the process to correct that disorder, to undo some of what is perceived as material damage, which is that child if it comes into this world. We know what abortion is. Abortion is the sacrament, again, to, well, the dark forces <laughs> of this world. And um, that's the offer that, that that they give in order to be liberated, to be free of the responsibility of family life, which has become much more difficult in a world of high finance and usury. I'll be the first to admit it, but it's still never justifiable to murder a child in the name of sexual sin and sexual pleasure. Yeah, and you know, and what's really kind of annoying me right now is when I hear like the Glenn Becks talk about, well, Government shouldn't be involved in this anyway. It should go to the state. Yeah. No, government should be involved in child murder. Yeah. If we can't be in, if the government can't say child murder is evil and wrong, then it can't say anything is wrong. Yeah. It's not, hey, let the people vote on it. If all the people voted to murder children, it would still be evil and wrong. The people shouldn't have their way. So government should be involved. They should be there to say, no, this is forbidden. You cannot do this. Not just, well, it's a state's right issue. If that's a state's rights issue, then so was slavery, and why did y'all have a civil war over it? Yeah. Why do y'all praise Abraham Lincoln for going to war with the states over slavery if it's just a state's rights issue? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and while conservatives are split on Abraham Lincoln, Beck happens to be one who sees Lincoln as a hero, I believe, because yeah. I remember you know, his his covenant theology thing that he often pushes, right? 
he, he said on his show that he believed that the when the um, Puritans or the Pilgrims got here and landed on America before, of course, the founding of the American government, that they made a, a uh, a, a covenant with God, and then a new covenant had to be established uh, with the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln. He believed Lincoln made a covenant with God to save the Republic. That's how I kind of know that he, he he's a big Lincoln fan. And so, listen, I, I've been I've been studying Beck a lot lately, um, and mainly because I'm starting to see some of, not only just the fallacies in his arguments. I think we've seen that for a long time here at the Knights of Christendom and called them out. But I'm just wondering, like you brought up right now, if the conservatives like Beck don't bring up more problems, actually, than they than they help out with, with society as a whole. You're right in the sense that. Listen, what, what is, uh, you know, you know, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. Right. Well, what does that mean when we say life? Right. Who has a right yeah. to life? Do all we citizens have a right to life? What about the unborn? See, they're opting out of that question in the end. If a, if a, if a nation in a country cannot support the most basic fundamental levels of life, then it has no purpose at that point anymore. And it seems here, because of the machinations of politics, where conservatives can't seem to work out a lot of these contradictions, they always surrender to the side of federalism and, of course, the states taking over the rights. But again, because there's a contradiction in your ideology, because you believe if the government steps in to do something, that it will continue to gain power and take control and grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, guess what? I got a newsflash for you. Government has been growing bigger and bigger and bigger, regardless of your worries and your fears. That's the irony of it all. And, and to me, Neil, it's not about limited government per se, as I'm one that believes in limited government. But what it's really about more than limited government is well-ordered government. That's what we had in the old world, and it worked better, right? What the likes of Mr. Beck will never admit is that a lot of these ideas of the founding have fallen flat on their face, starting with the inability for conservatives and classical liberals to maintain the, the size and scope of government. And now here we are with one of the most grand, hugest, biggest, most intrusive governments in the history of the world. And they're still doubling down on the same platitudes, the same mythology that was never able to stop the growth of government in the first place. And now they're telling us, guess what? Let's let all the blue babies, or should I say, all the babies in the blue states get slaughtered in the name of federalism, Neil. Yeah, I noticed that uh, they would not say, well, yes, our property rights should be states' rights. It shouldn't be protected by the federal government. Um, they wouldn't say that their own life should be, well, murder can be illegal in some states, but not other states. You know, They wouldn't say that's a states' rights thing. But when it comes to the unborn, all of a sudden, well, y'all can just make it up state by state. That's okay. And that's ridiculous. And the problem is, the thing, like I've said before, you're going to have a centralized government. Every government is a centralized government. That's right. An uncentralized government is a government that's going to fall apart. It needs to be centralized for it to work. We tried that with the Confederate states. It didn't work. They needed a federal state for it to work. Now, the question is, are you going to have a moral government? And we are in a society that said church and state are separate. Religion is a private matter, and it stays out the state. So you have a secular government, not a moral one. And because we're lacking that morality, that arbiter of morality and truth, well, then, of course, you're going to say, well, babies can die in the blue states, but not maybe not in the red states, only some in the red states, because the red states are not going to all ban it. Right. They're going to have exceptions, Okay. Uh, they're going to say for only so many weeks or months, you know. Um, so we're still going to kill babies. And the fact that no one can see how blatantly evil it is, not just wrong, evil. It's barbaric. It's practically pagan because that's what they did in the Old Testament, child sacrifice. Is it? And we're going to pretend like this is not wrong. It's a state's right thing. It's let the mob rule on it. Is it? Is it? Neil, that they don't see it, or is it that this left and right dichotomy in America, right, this battle between the left and the right, is such a cluster fart at this point that 
there's no way for many classical liberals to maneuver out of this and to argue for federalism, right? Because it seems to me, again, because they're so dead set against centralized authority and what they will call authoritarian governments, that they're fearful of what is doing right if it comes from a centralized location. Listen, I'll go back to the porn issue, right? Ben Shapiro wrote a book about a decade ago, I think now, how porn is terrible, porn is bad, it brainwashes young men's mind, it destroys the image of young ladies, it's, it's horrible, but, but, in the name of freedom and liberty, we cannot have a centralized authority, we cannot have, uh, you know, stop it or ban or any kind of way, every local community has to pick and choose whether they want porn. Okay, fine, but how do you build any societal continuity when it comes from that. I mean, moral principles don't start at the local level. In the old world, they start at the very top. There are certain things that are dictated to the church. Now, I get it. Ben Shapiro is a Jew. And in many ways, Jews are kind of like Protestants. It's kind of pick and choose your own doctrines in whatever branch you want. You got your liberal branch. You got your moderate branch. You got your conservative branch. But if we're talking about, okay, Judeo-Christian values, okay, which is a phrase that I find hilarious. But if we're talking that, if we're going back to the dictates of the old world and Christendom, morality didn't start at a local level. The church dictated morality. And then guess what? Governments and monarchs and, and again, uh, you know, more integralist nations, they dictated politics from there. But morality was decided by the church, not by every individual or individual community. I mean, it seems to me this whole religious liberty thing, which is nothing but a massive relativist idea at the end of the day, is what's supposed to govern our society. And then the classical liberals wonder why it's all going to crap. Well, like when you bring up Shapiro talking about porn, it's like, why is it when we talk about issues like property rights or... Um, economics uh, and and all that kind of stuff we expect the government to have a say but when it comes to the things that eat away at men's souls and destroys morality well hold on we can't outlaw that we got to let that go that's a personal thing yeah where, where do you get that from why is it the material is so much more important than the eternal welfare of people and they act like, well, if you're going to hell, well, that's just you. That's a personal thing. That's not going to affect society. As if bad morals in society doesn't affect all of society. We all are re related in that sense. How one person acts does have an effect on people around him. And thus goes out through society. If you're going to allow poison like pornography to filter through, well, then, of course, you're going to allow the homosexuality, the transgenders, the abortionists. You're going to allow all of it because it's just a matter of opinion. It's religious anarchy. It's moral anarchy. And I don't see, understand why they're so against material things, like I said, like property rights. Like, well, no, that has to be controlled by the government. We have to have uh, laws in place to govern that and this kind of thing, commerce. But these more important issues, like murdering babies, well, that's let the people vote. It's in the people's hands. Yeah, it's, Neil, it's because they've accepted rationalism as their God. And the Catholic Church or the old world or Christianity, it's a kind of a, a mythological personal choice if you want to believe in it. It's part and parcel part of the worship of the material world at the expense of the spiritual world. And the way, I mean, the way it, which is most obvious was, and I keep saying this, we have founding fathers that were very confused on their own religious beliefs. I don't care how well they knew their Bible or how many times they quoted their Bible. Um, they were um, unorthodox in their beliefs. And that chaos really drifted down to the rest of the nation. Um, let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question. And, 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 and listen, I live in Utah, and I'm not trying to start a war with my Mormon friends here at all because I like Mormons. I think they're good and decent people. They're very patriotic. But, you know, when you have a, a, the likes of Glenn Beck on the radio, who I'm starting to get the sense he thinks he's a Mormon prophet coming to the mainstream, right? Um, that's what I believe. I could be wrong. Um, but, you know, as, as, as we know, Mormonism is way out in left field 
left field that out in regards to Christian orthodoxy. I guess my question is, how dangerous is it when you have not just Catholics, but also, let's call it more traditional Protestants. Listen, I got a problem with all Protestants, don't get me wrong. But how dangerous is it when these way out of the mainstream figures, especially guys like Beck, who's a Mormon, Hanny has abandoned the church altogether. He's doing his kind of his own thing. Um, and, and in many respects, even Jews. Not Listen, my wife is half Jewish. No disrespect to Jews, but we don't have a lot of the, co the same common values. And I think that's part of the problem. But when you have the likes of a Beck, who seems to me and acts like a, a prophet of sorts, can we really get behind that, Neil? Um, no, because, you know, the, the fullness of truth is found in the Catholic Church. And so out, anything outside of that has to be rejected. You can't have a melting pot of uh, various dogmas when these dogmas pertain to your salvation, eternal life, morality. You can't just make it up as you go because then it's just subjective. It's but he would say... But he would say you're worshiping at the altar of religion when what we need is faith. The two cannot be divorced. Your faith comes from your religion, your religion and your faith. The, Jesus Christ founded a hierarchical church, not some spiritual, loosely uh, united thing you know, that doesn't have any kind of um, physical reality, that doesn't have a hierarchy. He founded an actual church upon Peter and the rest of the apostles that we are to follow and obey. From that, we have our faith. Our faith is developed through Christ and his church. The church goes through history and further developing our faith through morality, theology. That's the way Christ founded it. So you can't divorce the faith and truth from the church. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty much what it is. And when you say, you know, listen, I don't like religion. I like spirituality or faith. Well, what's your dogma? What are your doctrines? What do you believe in? Now, I think with a guy like Mr. Beck, he would deny that dogma is even important, even though he himself is a Mormon. It's interesting because the Mormon church has dogmas. They're not loosey-goosey. Um, in, in the same extent as this, you know, you know, this personal Jesus thing that we see oftentimes in America, but if you don't know what your dogmas are, then you don't know who God is. You don't know what the covenant actually is. The covenant is more than just taking a piece of paper and writing down your dictates and demand that God obeys you based upon, uh, again, your your own you know personal uh, I guess feelings on the matter. So that's why I ask, and, and a lot of this stuff is led by um, these libertarian types. Some claim to be religious. Um, and and they're giving us a libertarian kind of answer to the problems of the world because it seems like they don't want to get down and, and dirty in, in a lot of these social issues. And listen, I, I, I've been talking to some of my classical liberal friends that take the opposite approach to this. They don't like the libertarian approach. And they will tell you, even on the political right, listen, we screwed up 20 years ago, 30 years ago when we stopped fighting the culture war. Look where we're at now all of a sudden. There's, there's no fixing this. I mean, listen, when you got a situation where, you know, you got a bunch of pink hair people with all the piercings and all that stuff that they got going on, and some of these, they're not there because of your economics. They're not there because of your living. They're there because they want their sins justified. That's the irony of it all. And these people come from broken homes, broken families. Um, you know, you could try and thump the Constitution in their face. But when people are broken, you don't know which way they're going to fall, right? Uh, if Mr. Beck, judging by his history and how he had a broken life, and God bless him, he came out of it to kind of see the light. Okay, fine. He still went to the Mormon church, okay, which I have some, okay, well, whatever. Uh, but these people are broken, and they're there to have all their sins justified. Listen, we're a nation that is so comfortable. Well, we'll see about far along because the economy is collapsing as we speak. Yeah. But we're so comfortable, Neil that we actually have time to debate these issues. That's the irony of it all. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's. I think it was Chesterton who said that uh, 
when we are, uh, as we get worse off, if we don't turn to, we're not going to stop at atheism. We're going to go into paganism. You know, we're going to go back to that. It's a reversion, basically. I think we're there. Oh, yeah. 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 It's a, and that's what society has done. It's go, It's already turned back to, to being pagans. Um, worship of humans, you know, uh, humanism. Uh, and uh, the, the cults that have kind of come along with all of that, they're insane. They've just given up reason completely. I mean, like I said, if you're going to sit there and murder your own child and pretend like it's okay, how much more depraved can a person be? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. That That's what's baffling to me. I hear some of these young ladies screaming and screeching, and um, it's unfortunate because that's somebody's child that somewhere along the line has been lost in this liberty, liberally progressive culture in that sense. And I don't understand it. I've never understood it. Um, what breaks my heart even more, Neil, though, is <sighs> Catholics to support abortion. And what I mean by that is those of us that came from deep historical Catholic familial lines, our grandparents would have been horrified at the idea that not only of having abortion, but even if we would vocally support that. Our grandparents were devout. They came to this country, right, for opportunity, prosperity. Um, Europe had been bombed into oblivion. The infrastructure was destroyed. And, uh, you know, trying to, to, to find another way, they brought their faith. And, and, and listen, we talk about the apostasy, but here we are two, three, four generations in. And these um, these kids that have come from deep, rooted Catholic ancestral lines are now giving moral support to the slaughter of children. It's got to be heartbreaking to our grandparents who are rolling over in their graves, my friend. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, uh, we dishonor our ancestors. Yeah. Uh, and especially with this idea of modernism, we don't want to give what Cheston called uh, a vote to the dead. You know, we don't want, they, they don't get a vote. And because we're so obsessed with our modern times, they're so better, so much better than the ones that have come before us. So we don't even give them a vote um, through tradition, you know, and uh, upholding traditional values anymore. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's just disgusting, really. It's, it, it leaves one frustrated. You know, what do you say to these people? What do you do? You know, uh, when they're so out of their minds, uh, that they can't see what's right in front of their face, or if they do see, they, they don't want to see it. They, they mock it, you know? Yeah, I know. I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling I, I'm there with you. And, uh, you know, just to close it out, I'll say this. I saw a poll the other day where something like 48% of the American public is in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade. 45 is against it. The fact that nearly half of this country believes that abortion is okay under any circumstances it goes to show you the great moral disorder we have and why in this country we're at each other's throats and why... There really seems to be no resolution to this uh, at this point in history. I think in a lot of ways, Neil, everything we've said here in Knights of Christian for the past, what, three years almost now, um, it's all come to pass. It's all come to fruition. We've been, we've nailed it every step of the way. Um, and, um, and, I, and to be honest with you, I wish we were wrong. I wish we weren't right on these issues, my friend. Your final thoughts. Well, I'd say uh, some of this problem stems from a massive uh, acceptance of contraceptives. Yeah. Um, that ties directly into abortion, because if one is allowed, then the other must be allowed for when contraception fails. It, it just flows into each other. To that poll you mentioned, I would, if I was, uh, what I would say to them is, I don't care what your poll says. None of you people get to decide this. OK, it is a, it is from God. Youth shall not murder. So I don't care if 100 percent of you uh, of the people uh, think abortion should be legal. Your opinion doesn't matter. The truth matters. And you're not going to get your way. That's what a government should say. It doesn't matter what these people want. We're going to uphold the laws of God. 
and murder is wrong, whether you're unborn or born. You don't get to do it. And it doesn't matter what the people's opinion is on that subject. It doesn't matter what the states say about that subject. It's wrong, period, objectively. So you don't get an opinion on it. And see, as Americans, we don't want to hear that. No. We want to think we have a say on everything. <laughs> we want, we want, we're, we're these extreme individualists who have an opinion and a right to speak out on every issue and we get to decide it. No, I'm sorry. That's, where, that's why we have a conflict with God. Because God goes, you don't have a say. That's right. It's wrong, period. And it grates up against us so bad, we can't stand it. And that's yeah. why you see these people screaming and yelling. Because there's that line where we constantly say, no, you're wrong. What you're doing is evil. It doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what your opinion is. You're still wrong. Beautifully said, my friend. I don't think I could add much to that. So uh, we're going to wrap it up here to Knights of Christendom. Um, you know, I'll just say this. Roe v. Wade, it would be monumental if it were to get overturned because I never thought we would see that in my lifetime. Um, I know we still have problems. It's not the perfect situation, but it's a start. It would be a monumental moral victory, but even more so a victory that is desperately needed um, by, let's call it, let's call it the right side of the aisle, right? Whether you're integralist, whether you're classical liberal, whatever it may be, because we've seen the country go perpetually to the left in America. And uh, there's a lot of people shaking their heads, frustrated to where we're going. Uh, this would be huge. But as we've seen in past decisions with the Supreme Court, they've known to change their mind at the last minute. And uh, this leak, I think, is a shenanigans at work behind the scenes that none of us are seeing. And so I'm hopeful. I'm praying. Um, but at the same time, I will reserve my excitement from when we get the official word. Neil, my friend, thank you for joining me tonight. My pleasure. Always happy to join you. Awesome, buddy. Thank you so much for your insight. That was beautiful as usual. This is Frank signing off for Knights of Christian. Good night, everybody. <laughs>